I'm Dr. Stephanie Champion. And I'm Dr. Tamara Agnew. And today we're talking to Dr. Cameron Shearer, who is talking about his PhD experience with a project that didn't quite go as planned. Welcome to Career Sessions with your hosts, Steph and Tamara, proudly sponsored by Inspiring South Australia. In this series of career sessions, all of our guests hold doctorates in their chosen field and we invite them to talk about their pathway from PhD candidate to present day. We ask them what they've learned and we also ask them to give advice to people who might be thinking about a career in research when they've finished school or when they've finished their undergraduate degree. Dr Cameron Shearer graduated from Flinders University School of Physical Sciences in 2012 following the completion of his thesis entitled Fabrication and Applications of Carbon Nanotube Silicon Nanostructures. Since then, he has attracted more than $2 million in grant funding for his work. In 2018, he was awarded the Young Tool Poppy of the Year Award, a campaign that recognises the achievements of Australian scientists. He is an active science communicator and is often found discussing all things science on the podcast Publish, Perish or Podcast. So welcome, Cameron. Oh, thanks, Steph. Okay, so Cameron, let's start by talking about what your role is now and yep. where you are and what your day looks like. Okay, so I'm what's called a researcher and business fellow at the University of South Australia. I'm working there in the, what are we called, the Academic Unit of Health and Clinical Sciences, I think. We just changed Sounds very names. formal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I'm working with an industry partner there. Uh, called Membrane Systems Australia, and I am helping them develop a process for the remediation of wastewater, Mm. Um, and particularly a toxic contaminant that's um, growing more and more in the world, Um, and it was uh, used a lot in firefighting liquids. Ah. Okay. (laughs) Is that something we should be worrying about in South Australian water? Well, so there are areas where the level of this material, did Mm. I say it before, PFAS, Mm. uh, perfluorinated alcohol substances, is there are areas where it is greater than the uh, EPA drinking water limit. Mm -hmm. But it's mainly that it was up around Newcastle or the Williamstown Air Base kind of area, wasn't it, around? So those areas around air bases are particularly badly contaminated. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do have an air base in South Australia Mm -hmm. and uh, it's on the record that there is contamination um, around the groundwater there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that water isn't used for drinking at all in mm-hmm. um, South Australia. But definitely something that needs to be investigated. <laughs> so what yes. does your day look like then? Well, so I'm doing, uh, in the morning I'll come in and I'll try and do chemical experiments. Uh, I have an idea of basically what I want to do each week. Um, I try and tick a few of those experiments off. A lot of the experiments I do have 24-hour waiting times between each mm-hmm. step. Mm-hmm. So when I have the waiting time, then I would do something like analysis or literature review of what to do next. A lot of my literature review includes reading government reports, mm-hmm. which are very long, mm-hmm. and it takes a long time to really understand what's new behind mm-hmm. it all. And then beyond that, I also try and do other academic-type pursuits like write papers or mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I'm not giving any lectures at the moment, mm-hmm. but um, something towards that end goal. So pretty purely a research role. Yes. Do you supervise any students? Not in this current role, no. Uh, It's a new research project to the university um, when I moved there Mm -hmm. about eight months ago. Uh, And so there's uh, not many people working on it. There's another person also working on water, but not on my particular water contaminant. So you can really focus. We'll go back. Let's go back in time. Okay. Um, We're going back to sort of high school mm-hmm. era, just to sort of get understand how you got where you are now. So did your parents go to university? So my mother didn't go to university. And when I was growing up and going through high school and university, I was of the opinion that my father did not go to university. Um, <laughs> and there was some <laughs> discord about All children that, would assumption. think that about their parents. <laughs> well, so I don't think I ever told him that he never went to university, but I now realise that not only did he go to university, but I have memories of going to university with him. <laughs> <laughs> because when I was like very early memories are going to the library at the university with him. I don't know what university he went to, but he 
was a plumber, mm-hmm. and at one point he transitioned to teach plumbing at TAFE. Oh. Uh, and so to do that, he needed some kind of university degree uh-huh. in teaching. Mm-hmm. So he did a diploma or something like that in teaching. So that was when I was a child. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, not many people in my family had gone to university. Mm-hmm. So was going to university something that was assumed that you would do or is it you went against the grain to go to university? I think it, for me it was actually assumed mm-hmm. that I would do. I generally did pretty well at school and then it just, I don't think I really showed any real interest in anything other than sports. Mm-hmm. So I just had to continue doing education, I guess. Mm-hmm. So something or you always assumed or did your parents encourage encourage you and in, in, in that direction as well? Uh, I think they have always let me really choose things for myself. Mm-hmm. So I don't feel like I was encouraged mm. to or not to go to university. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But they obviously supported me so I didn't, they paid for me to go to university. Mm-hmm. I didn't incur the, a debt. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. So that's a pretty good support. You're very mm-hmm. lucky, yeah. So when did you know that you wanted to go to uni? Did you, did you, it was just a natural transition from school? Yeah, I don't think there was ever a moment where I just thought about it. Mm-hmm. I think it just happened. Um, doing year 12, at one point you're asked to fill in yeah. what <laughs> things you want to do at university. Mm-hmm. And so at that point I thought, okay, well, I better write down what courses I want to apply <laughs> for. And, and it kind of just went organically like that. And you knew what you wanted to apply for? I knew what subjects I liked. Mm -hmm. I liked chemistry and physics. I didn't do the harder math Mm -hmm. subject. Um, And so that kind of limited which courses I could do that included physics. Mm -hmm. So I was actually down to one that where the prerequisites were chemistry and physics and not math. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why I did a Bachelor of Science in Nanotechnology at Flinders University. Right. So you, your year 12 choices really dictated where you went afterwards. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yes. Um, so anywhere else to do something that involved physics, I would have had to have done math. Mm-hmm. I probably should have realised that before I chose my year 12 subjects, but I, yeah, I had not looked I had <laughs> yeah. not looked ahead. So did you go to university straight from school? Yeah, straight yeah. away. Yeah. And you went to Flinders. So what was, oh, so you said your undergraduate degree, Bachelor of Science in Nanotechnology. <laughs> yeah. I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So then you you went through, was it three or four years? Was it honours? What what happened? So, yeah, so this was a three-year degree. So mm. it basically was just a Bachelor of Science mm. with an inbuilt Focus. assumed mm. honours, uh, which was a research project, which is probably the only time I really did anything nanotechnology-like. <laughs> wow. Um And so, yeah, so four years in all. Mm -hmm. And then did you do master's? No. So from the honours, I went straight into the PhD. Mm -hmm. Um, The way it was was basically depending upon the score you got for your honours mark, you could be offered a a scholarship to Mm -hmm. do the PhD. Um, And so I happened to get the score Mm -hmm. that on the very last day of honours, I found out the score I got. And because of that score, I knew I was going to be offered a PhD scholarship. Yep. And that so sealed was, the deal for you. You then. didn't have to apply for that? Uh, so I, I, I had yeah, applied yeah, for yeah, the right, PhD okay, scholarship yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, so on the day I finished honours, say late November, mm-hmm. whatever year that was, 2007, I think, uh, I then knew I, was, I had a PhD scholarship waiting for me. And so in that kind of intervening period between late November and the next year, I had the choice of, finding work or looking at the options of finding work Mm -hmm. or just taking a long holiday because I knew I had a PhD (laughs) on offer coming up and I did not look at any other option. Yep. (laughs) So what did you do? You you just took that time out to... Yeah, I had a a, a a nice... nice long holiday. Yeah, I mean, I had a nice summer at home. It's strange how uh, as an undergraduate student, I always felt like I didn't have enough free time to myself. But looking back now, oh, yeah. it's amazing, amazing you how never much free get time four I had. Four month long breaks. No, I know. <laughs> I know. So I yeah, I might have wasted a bit of that time. Um yeah. You don't know how lucky you are. Hind- hindsight is twenty twenty vision, <laughs> <Yep>. right? <laughs> so uh when you decided that you were gonna do your PhD or when you got your scholarship. Yep. Um was it? Did you tack onto somebody's grant, or did you get to to have full reign over your own choices for your study? Yeah, so it was on a grant. So three uh, academics at Flinders 
Uh, I didn't change universities for the PhD or even research groups. But three academics there had won an Australian Research Council grant, Mm -hmm. uh, a few hundred thousand dollars to work on a particular research project. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I was asked to work on that project. Um, And so that's pretty much what I did from the start. Mm -hmm. I didn't mind that happening because I wasn't particularly ambitious at the time. I didn't really have an idea of exactly what I wanted to do. If I had to say anything, I would say I would have wanted to work more in renewable energy, mm-hmm. which is what I, I'm not doing that right now, but I did do in the past. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know how to start because mm-hmm. no one at Flinders was working on renewable energy at the time. Yep. And I, so I didn't know if I just looked someone up and I asked them, can I come do my PhD with you? I assumed they would laugh at me and say no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, I now know that they probably would very strongly Be consider very it. Very pleased. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Particularly if I had a PhD scholarship, scholarship. myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You went on with a project that your supervisors had sort of defined. Yes. Did you get any freedom within that? Uh, so I did have some freedom um, in that I was all the while I was working on a number of side projects. Mm-hmm. And some of them were suggested by one of the academics. So I had three academics, but they were each in a different research group. So they kind of had their own angle. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I would say angle, but the gender (laughs) might also be laden. And so I kind of had a side project going on in each of the research groups. Um, But that, but at the same time, I was still expected to work on this project that they'd won, which was to make a water filter. Uh, but not just any type of water filter. It was a water filter uh, using carbon nanotubes, so from the title of the mm-hmm. thesis, mm-hmm. which are tiny cylinders of carbon, so small that um, only water could fit down the middle of the cylinder. Mm. Okay. Uh, so it. Oh, so any particles in the water would be filtered out. Any okay. particles in yeah. the water would be filtered, filtered out. Even salt is mm. too big to go through. So it would be not only a, like a, a filtration, but also it could be a desalination. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, to I keep getting my years wrong, 2008-ish, mm-hmm. desalination was a very big thing. Yeah. Um, that yeah. was when the desalination plant was being built in, in Adelaide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had our lowest water levels ever, yep. I believe. Um, so a lot of concerns about where our drinking water was going to come from. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So my the, the project idea, and there was some theory behind it and some very highly publicized articles who had shown proof of concept mm-hmm. were to make was to make a filter using these carbon nanotubes yep and each of the three academics had a special speciality that would kind of if they all came together seamlessly it would make a nice water filter mm-hmm. it's a very good grant i can see why it was it got awarded. money and yeah yep. and so how did did it, did it did it work? Did it work? <laughs> no, so no, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a result worth publishing as well, folks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely, you have to publish those failures as well. Yeah. So I had uh, everything is going well for two and a half years or so, and then I basically got to the point where I assembled the water filter. I had the carbon nanotubes kind of aligned. Um, the gaps between the carbon nanotubes were filled in, mm-hmm. and they were sitting on a a porous surface to support them. Uh, But even with everything kind of going exactly to plan, the membrane that I was making was so weak that it would break under the weight of water. Mm. Oh, and that's a rather fundamental problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if if the weight of water breaks the membrane, it's not a very good water filter. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Um, and so how long did you actually spend on your project? So that was at the two and a half year mark. I don't know how good my memory is, but I believe it's about two and a half years in. Mm. I had probably been spending six months at that very last step mm-hmm. where basically I would do the same experiment every day. I would do the same experiment every day. And by the end, and it would be a very long day. Mm-hmm. And by the end of the day, I see my membrane break. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> that sounds like the most demoralizing thing in the yeah. world. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was very demoralized. So it became so I kind of felt like I'd had enough work done for a thesis, except I was two and a half 
years in mm. and the scholarship goes for three years yep. or three and a half years in if you can argue for an extension in uh, at that university mm. so I was sure that my supervisors wouldn't let me give up mm. at mm. two and a half years in maybe in hindsight if I really asked for it they might have agreed to mm. it um, but after six months of trial and error I had no ideas of what I had I had no idea what to do next. Mm. Uh, they didn't really have an idea themselves of what to do next because by that stage, I was the expert on this project. Um, they weren't. They couldn't really give me advice anymore, mm-hmm. um, and so I was really stuck. Um, it it kind of got worse when uh, some parts of the project that had been working well for the two years stopped working because we changed supplier for one of the items that I used. And so, yeah, so it kind of became a point where I just wanted to like almost just sit in my room for that last six months, Yep. wait until three years are up. And then I say, Hey guys, I'd like to keep doing this, but my three years are up. I should start writing my thesis. Mm -hmm. I had some very lazy weeks, months in there. And then at one point I requested a meeting and I said, look, I don't want to do this anymore, but I'll do this other thing instead. So I yep. had those side projects going along mm-hmm. and I thought if I just focus on this one for a little while, um, I could maybe get some papers out of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the same time, then my thesis wouldn't be about making the water filter like the grant was, mm-hmm. but it would just be about making a, a series of carbon nanotube based devices. Yep. Um, and so the water filter, instead of being the whole thesis, was a chapter. Yep. Uh, and then the side projects I had going on became a chapter. Got elevated. Each. Yeah. So was the grant, um, was the aim of the grant to to end result in a product that would have made the university money, or is that why they wanted you to kind of keep pushing forward, or or was it really about the knowledge? It was the knowledge. So this 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 particular grant scheme is more fundamental chemistry based, okay. uh, and so. I I don't know how they worded it to the to the grant scheme um, convener, mm-hmm. but I imagine they could have used all of my side projects mm-hmm. as evidence of what they'd done within that other project. Yeah, because I was still using the carbon nanotubes, which were the main component of the grant. Mm-hmm. So a lot went wrong, or you faced a lot of challenges. Yeah, how did you keep going? Um. How old were you when you were doing your PhD? Oh, so I was young. Mm. Uh-huh. So I was 17 plus 4, 21, so 21 22 wow. at the beginning. Yep. Uh, and I had my PhD by 25. Um, I think I kind of have an ability to forget about things <laughs> and not think about them. Yep. Um, so that was hard, but it's in the past now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Or it's, I won't think about that now. I'll think about that when it really matters, mm-hmm. um, which is good in when things are bad, I can kind of keep going. But it also means that I have a terrible record at the moment with, say, conference talks or other deadlines where I don't begin my conference talk until the day before yeah. I actually have to do the conference <laughs> talk. Um, and I was at a conference this year mm-hmm. where I hadn't done my talk, but I also didn't realise which day I was on. <laughs> so I was sure I was sure that I was on Thursday and then I was staying in Brisbane with a friend and we were mm-hmm. going through the timetable for what to look at tomorrow, being the Monday. And he said, and look, oh, there you are. He said, oh, Cam- Dr. Cameron Shearer. And I'm like, ha-ha, very funny. And he goes, no, no, really, one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and that's the point I keel over and die. <laughs> You're right. Right, okay, let's get going then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So There'll be I, no beer today. <laughs> <laughs> so I had uh, just a few hours to, to do the talk. And I, it was half done already from a previous mm-hmm. talk. But Yep. Uh, so I think that's. I mean, honestly, that's really the way that I got through things. I didn't have mm. any mature way or any uh, logical way apart from the fact that I I could really just forget about it mm-hmm. or ignore it, which is probably the less healthy way to um, <laughs> forgetting about it and ignoring it's pretty similar. But, yep. but it also yep. is, it gives you that ability to just keep marching on and, and 
like you say, come back to it when you have to, which is when you're going to have to write it up and then you can reflect. Yes. And you've had time and space so that you can reflect on it, probably to give it a bit more of a positive yeah. light than, um, than a, oh, it was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I had the side projects going on and they yep. were always went to plan, which, I mean, in hindsight is, is very lucky, mm -hmm. uh, but that helped as well with the fact that I was still getting some positive results when I was working on other projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then thinking about what was the most exciting part of your PhD journey, yep. it wasn't the PhD itself, it was the side product? Uh, they probably were the most exciting things to work on. Uh, but I mean, by far the most exciting thing for me was um, the first paper mm. was the first, most exciting thing. Um, I don't know if you think about it. I think of like at that time I thought of papers as like, a, a version of immortality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is, you know, my name is on something that will last forever, yep. I think. This is my legacy. <laughs> yes. And in those days, papers were still published on paper. Yeah. I don't know how often that, that was, And now. you get a physical copy that <laughs> yeah. you can then enjoy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no digital versions. <laughs> yeah. And um, the other things were the times when I could tell someone that I was the first person to do this. Yeah. Even if it was very specific. Yep. So, and uh, other people often didn't care at all, but <laughs> I, yeah, I don't care if other you people made your mark. I was happy. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. How would you um, describe the life of a PhD student? It's, it's, which is different, going to be different for everybody I speak to, because I'm just thinking that you were, if you were 21 when you were doing it, I was, I turned 40 while I was doing my PhD. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was a very different um, experience for me. But for you, what, what is the life of a PhD student? And also based on your experience as a supervisor, I suppose. Yeah. To me, the, Life of a PhD student is repetitive, mm -hmm. frustrating, challenging, and rewarding. And I think I need to add a caveat on the rewarding part in that it's unfair that effort in doesn't always mean reward yeah. out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so it's rewarding, but not when you expect it, or you mm -hmm. can't expect it to be rewarding. It kind of has to be rewarding in its own way, um, much in the way that, Things that are difficult, when you finish them, is more rewarding when they were difficult. If something is easy, mm -hmm. there's no there's no real feeling of rewarding mm -hmm. yep. there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I totally get that. Is that almost sense of satisfaction of of uh, completing something rather than necessarily the results being explosive, blow your mind? But mm. um, you got through it. Yeah, you got it done. You did it. Yeah, uh, an element of challenge in things. I mean. People add challenges to everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, computer games aren't fun if there's no challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. it's just run, like hold your hand down on the right hand button and so you, you go the all the way to the end, yeah. <laughs> there's no fun there. There's yep. got to be some obstacles along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So would you do it again? Uh, so I would. Mm -hmm. um, I think I would do some things differently, but I would do a PhD again, I believe. I wasn't very ambitious. Mm -hmm. And I think this probably comes back to how to being young. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a, a life goal or a one year, five year plan and things like that that I do think about now. As I, I think I already said it, that I would have chosen to change universities, change research groups to pursue uh, someone or a group that are working at the highest echelon of mm -hmm. the topic. I was interested in. Yep. Mm. Uh, the issue that I wasn't particularly interested in any topic mm. um, at that stage, but that's what I would do if I go back differently. Mm -hmm. And then going back to from year 12, going into university, um, I think that I would have considered more the job applications post or the job opportunities yep. post study. Mm -hmm. So as I said, I just was, I was just interested in chemistry and physics, so that's what I went and studied. And I think that's good mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't consider it all the job applications. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother would always ask me, so what does a nanotechnologist do? <laughs> <laughs> and I know that my answer was never sufficient because she would ask me every single time. <laughs> <in the visit. laughs> So I'd, I'd always just chalk it down to her being old and not listening, but I think it's because I didn't know what it was and so yeah. I couldn't explain what it yeah. was. Mm -hmm. And I still don't really know what it was because it's kind of just a name for a degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think if I, I went back, I'd probably do something more engineering-focused mm -hmm. um, than science-focused uh, basically because... Um, oh, the other thing I would have... Sorry. 
I'll go back again. Yeah. The other thing that's important to think of is that, say, careers in science um, tend to be more global. Um, and so opportunities are worldwide, mm-hmm. but opportunities locally are very small. Mm-hmm. Um, and so at that, going into the PhD, I probably thought that I was happy to be a, a global person and, and live in another country because I never really moved away from home before. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if I, say, did an engineering degree, I, there are global options, but there are many more local, local options. options. Yeah. yeah. Um, and knowing what I know now that I've chosen to remain in the city that I grew up in, mm-hmm. it would be easier for me to have, a say, an engineering degree background. Um, but having said that, I've never been unemployed, so the science degree yeah. is, is working so far. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's doing its so job. Far, so good. <laughs> Um, did you have a good relationship with your supervisors? Yeah, so I did. Mm. Uh, I, I like all of them. Uh, one of the, my main supervisor, I still am in regular contact with, Mm -hmm. and they are my best, uh, source of advice on, on big decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, I realized recently that I'm only really contacting him when I'm in, when I have trouble or (laughs) or something (laughs) like that. Um, so it's. It's very good when I realise I have an opportunity to contact him that's not me in trouble but to say <laughs> something good is going on or or something like that. Uh, so, yeah, so we had we had regular meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they would always attend and they would always be on time. Mm-hmm. I hate when people are late. Yes. Um, and uh, they would basically let me run the meeting. Uh, I would say what I had done. I would say what I planned to do next. Mm-hmm. And they would mostly just say, sounds good. Yep. Uh, and that's all I needed. Uh, yeah, other students. Base and, yeah, yeah. Other students need more, and that's what I'm finding as a as a supervisor, but that's all I wanted. It's something to keep you accountable, isn't it? It's like you've got these deadlines and you've got a meeting and you need to go and say, I've done it, tick, tick, tick. And yeah, yeah. yeah I, was, I think I was probably a little more like that. I didn't need, and my supervisors, two of them who have been here, mm-hmm. uh, offered a lot more. And, and it was great. And, and in hindsight, it was really very good for me to get that as well. When I, What I thought all I needed was that. Ticker box. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mini deadlines are, are very helpful, mm-hmm. um, particularly one of the parts of the PhD is um, time management. Mm-hmm. Small deadlines like regular meetings. Yeah. Yes. Uh, very, uh, oh, yeah. And, I and like actually, them now actually tu- as an academic. <laughs> yeah. Tutoring undergraduates, um, uh, I wish we had a little more time management. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> um, so then after once you'd completed your research, yep. how did you convey your outcomes to the world? Like you had to satisfy a grant committee, mm-hmm. um, but how was your research project important to the wider world? Were you able to translate it into something? So it was always through research articles mm-hmm. was the only real way that we transferred our knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, so I published a handful of papers Um I also had the opportunity to go on the children's television science show Scope. Nice. Mm. Uh, once during my PhD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was also interviewed by the advertiser at one time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, there wasn't There's a lot. There's quite different audiences. Totally. There. Yeah. Yes. Having to, and having to put your really niche knowledge yes. to an audience of how old, how old's an audience for that show for scope uh 10 i think is so what yeah explain it to a 10 year old it's, it makes you have to think about it in different ways and make it accessible yes yeah. well so the good thing with the scope i don't know if anyone else has explained it but i had an interview with their science writer mm-hmm. and then they wrote the script uh-huh. uh, okay um, and so yeah <laughs> they, they, communicated. they translated my <laughs> science words to a 10 year old okay um and so that yeah that made it a lot easier for me (laughs) and your experience with the advertiser did they sort of translate it well or did they sort of lose the point a little bit of what you were trying to tell them Uh, so i think that they made it all make sense so Mm -hmm. the scope thing and the advertiser or the local newspaper Mm -hmm. were both on the water filter Mm yeah and so that had a pretty clear that has a nice story to it. Yep. Um, I haven't even mentioned my side projects because they are they are much less easier to explain yep. their um, relevance to to mm-hmm. anything. Um, and so but they involve carbon carbon nanotubes, nanotubes are involved. Yep. <laughs> yes. 
Very small. I'm things. satisfied with just that bit of information. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. That's enough. Um, so, how did you get from your PhD into your academic career? Uh, so, th- from the PhD, I applied for. Uh, all right. So, we are told <laughs> that once when you do a PhD, you go overseas and do a postdoc. Yep. And then you come back, and local universities will Karma. really <laughs> will really want to offer you a lecturing position. So, I did step one. I applied for. Uh, many jobs. I think I applied for, what's the, I have the number, 37, I think, oh. uh, postdoc jobs, mm-hmm. uh, only looking overseas. Originally was only looking in English speaking countries, but I had to expand out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I ended up being offered and I accepted a job at the University of Munster um, in say, central West Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was there for two years. Uh, and then I was going to, and then I applied for a research fellowship uh, to come back to Australia. Mm. Uh, so I really enjoyed my time in Germany. I became a better person while I was over there. I became a better scientist mm-hmm. while I was over there. Not quite as important, <laughs> um, but living in an apartment for a while um, kind of really made me miss the Australian lifestyle mm. that I, like I didn't imagine I would. How did you go with language? The language, was it much of a language barrier? I mean, mostly they speak English, but. Yeah, so most of the time it wasn't too hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went to a language school uh, at night while I was there. The times where it was hard and one of the, and the reason why, so I went across with my girlfriend, now wife as well. Um, Things like tax is only in German. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, We had a, a superintendent in the building that we uh, lived in only spoke German. Mm. So he would knock on the door at 7.30 in the morning and he would say something to us (laughs) and I might recognise that he says water or heating or something like that. Mm. But mostly I would just say, I noticed that it's him and just say, okay, come on, it's weird. We're in our pajamas. uh, Go right ahead. Come in our apartment. I don't know what you're here for. (laughs) And so like... So that's, that's a little thing. It's funny when it happens once, but when it happens <laughs> like day. five times, uh, it just it just built to the point where we thought, look, we are either had to stay here, learn German and become Germans, or mm-hmm. let's just um, back, come back to Australia again. Mm-hmm. So I applied for a research fellowship to come to uh, Australia and my uh, supervisor from my PhD said, yep, apply for that. If you don't get it, I'll offer you a one-year position. Mm. Uh, so I didn't get the research fellowship, but I took up the one-year position back at Flinders University again. Yep. Mm. Um, that was working on the Collins class submarines, mm. oh. um, um, some part of the batteries there. And then while I was there, the supervisor got another grant, uh, this time for working on solar cells, mm. which was kind of this interest in renewable energy. Uh, so that ended up being a two-and-a-half-year postdoc. And then at the end of that, he, my supervisor announced that he was leaving to go to the University of Queensland. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, he suggested to me, you've been at Flinders too long, go work somewhere else. At the same time as he was leaving, I uh, got a fellowship to work at the University of Adelaide yeah. mm-hmm. for a year, uh, where I did a very similar project to what I had done in Germany, um, which was uh, renewable energy again. Um, so I was there for a year and a half. And then that uh, contract was coming to an end. It didn't look like I had any other options, but I was uh, contacted out of the blue by a University of South Australia, uh, a group there uh, who were talking with an industry partner, Membrane Systems Australia, who wanted help on this uh, remedi- uh, water remediation project. Uh, we had a meeting and they said, I want you to do this. Uh, I took it away. I looked it back and said, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. We had another meeting and said, I won't do what you wanted me to do, but instead I'll do this other thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they said, okay. <laughs> uh, and so I got this now one year researcher in business fellowship, um, partly sponsored by the industry partner and the uh, government, um, doing something that was my idea in the first place, which is are really good to be working on my own bad idea mm-hmm. than someone else's bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> so you've managed to get, you hit the trifecta. You've gone to all of the universities uh, in I South have Australia. all of the IDs. I have all of the email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the projects were 
somewhat related, but you've clearly moved a bit on your topics. Yes. So how has the research skills from your PhD been transferred to your roles that you've had post-PhD? A lot of it was based on very careful analysis of surfaces, Mm -hmm. Uh, what atoms are present at a surface, what is that atom bonding to at a surface. It is very specific. And that is the same thing that I've done at every single job. That is what I've even taken to this industry related job. Mm-hmm. I just didn't tell them that that's what I was looking at <laughs> when I explained it to them. Well, now well it's out now. <laughs> I think he's a bit busy to, to listen to this. <laughs> you might. Um, and so that's the main thing that's really followed it on. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it's just it's project management skills. Uh, and um, it's also the idea that it's not so much what you know, mm-hmm. but how well you convey it yep. and also who you talk to. I have got the one job out of the blue, um, the or the the one job that I applied for, the mm-hmm. one in Germany where I didn't know the person. Other than that, it's been either, hey, apply for this, mm-hmm. or I want you to come do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, one of the another reason to leave Flinders University was everyone there knew me, they knew what I could do. Mm-hmm. If a job came up in the future, they might offer it to me or they know where I am. I yeah. need to have the other people in South Australia yeah. know what I can do. do. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so that's a another reason why I have consciously tried to move on. Yeah. Um, Very strategic. It is. Yeah. It is. So would you be here? Do you, well, I don't think you could, uh, but I'm going to ask anyway. Do you think you could be where you are today without your PhD? Well, so... Technically, no, I wouldn't be eligible for the fellowship that I have <laughs> right now without a PhD. Yeah. The answer is probably no. Mm. But, yeah, working in re- renewable energy or uh, environmental science is kind of what I've been pushing towards more recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, is something that I could be working on without the PhD. Mm-hmm. Whether I would have found myself there or not, I don't know. I don't know. I always say that my backup job is real estate agent, but I don't know why. I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> no offence to real estate agents. I wanted to be a florist. My backup career is like a, my fallback is I would go and do floristry because I just want to hang out with flowers. And... Oh, I always wanted to open a secondhand bookshop, which might be the only job that's more insecure than academia. <laughs> well, not if you own the bookshop. <laughs> the job's secure, but the money's I, I, not. I could always bring in, you know, sell cupcakes as well. Um so considering you have clearly made a decision to stay in academia, mm-hmm. what sacrifices have you had to make or compromises you've had to make in your PhD or in your or subsequent roles to pursue that career pathway? Or am I making assumptions? Were there sacrifices to make? The people who I've seen actually l- achieve an academic career in my field of chemistry mm-hmm. um, have gone overseas. Mm. Uh so I have not yet made it in an academic career. Uh, I have a, I had a one year contract. Um, I I know I'll have a four year contract after this. Mm-hmm. Um, and four years is quite indulgent yes. in academia. <laughs> yes, it's very good. Uh, but I so I think that the sacrifice I've really made is I've chosen to risk my academic career for my lifestyle that I've chosen. Mm. Uh, I I would otherwise I would say. I've sacrificed leaving my family and friends behind, but I've chosen not to sacrifice that. Mm -hmm. Um, So the main sacrifice is really I've chosen job insecurity Mm -hmm. versus living in Adelaide. Uh, But luckily my wife has job security. (laughs) uh, And so at least one of us should have a job, even if I have to become an unsuccessful real estate estate agent, agent. (laughs) which I will be unsuccessful. I don't know. You're doing a good job selling, selling your, <laughs> selling your science. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, how do you think that the universities can go about better promoting the research and the work that goes on within their walls? That's a good question. I think that really no one knows what actually happens within the university. It's a very mysterious, like yes. the ivory tower idea. Yeah, um, I think it really. Firstly, it comes down to having better websites for each of the academic groups. Um, at one stage, I was in like a early career researchers group and I had a suggestion that, uh, so 
within the department I was in, every year we had a symposium where lots of people were expected to talk. Mm -hmm. I said, why don't we ask the supervisors to do three minute theses every year on their research? Mm -hmm. And then that would be recorded and could be put on their um, website um, so that all the way, if anyone ever wanted to know actually what they do right now or what yeah. they've done in the last year, they would have that three minute summary yeah. up there all the time. Uh, I go to a lot of re people people's research websites and they are not up to date. Mm -hmm. Or if they are up to date, their real audience is potential collaborators. Their yeah. audience isn't the public. Yeah. They're looking to attract grant people, yes. not the public. Not translate their research. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of events going on uh, that the public can attend. So there's there's Night of Science, there's, uh, is it Science, Science in the Pub? Oh, yeah. Pine yeah. of Science, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, things like this, which are very good. But I don't know if the public is really interested at the mm -hmm. same time. So there are two groups of people. We need to get better talk to the public, but the public at the same time Meet actually need middle. to show some interest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know about the middle, but yeah. <laughs> there's there's a, there's a point where we've got to touch, um, and I don't know, I don't really know the first step for either group of what to do. Mm. That's interesting because the science in the pub thing really is about attracting scientists to the pub mm. to talk their science, yeah, um, and with guest speakers who are scientists doing their science. So and and it, I don't, and, and while it's meant to be accessible, I think that even then it's uh, if if science is off people's radars, they're not going to come. Yeah. And things yeah. like Science Week and um, and Inspiring SA are doing what they can to try and create Bridge more. the gap. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. But I think that, yeah, you're right. I think that both parties need to come to the party. Yes. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, anyone in the public wants to write to me and let me know what they want me to tell them, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are accessible. I think that's an important <laughs> yes. thing to say is that uh, academics want to share. Yeah, Lots of academics want to share. I oh, won't yeah, say we're all finding of them. that. No, we're finding yeah. that everybody is very keen to to share and very okay. generous with the time. So it's that's interesting. Nice. Um, so what what is a PhD? Uh, all right. So I know the textbook answer is a <laughs> uh, PhD is a uh, collection of work which are meant to contain new knowledge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what it is is people read. A lot of things in a particular area, they decide what can I do that's new, mm -hmm. and then they try and do it and see if it works yeah. or not. Um, I think that's a PhD. So, what was it to you? It was it was it exactly that? I don't know if I was really concerned about new knowledge <laughs> in my PhD. Uh, maybe I was interested in doing things that were new, but. I mean, mostly the PhD was really about my own curiosity mm -hmm. um, and kind of testing my own ability to, to, uh, yeah, do things. But that's mm -hmm. kind of doing something new. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, given the number of people who are completing um, PhDs each mm -hmm. year, and we put the numbers at, 11, uh, I think 000? it was about eleven thousand and a couple, yeah, in in the a year statistics. Yeah. In, in Australia. In Australia. Okay. <laughs> um, for people who are contemplating... Which is across, a, a, across oh, all yeah. fields. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not an insane amount. <laughs> um, but for people who are contemplating a PhD, what would you say to them? Well, I, so I think that um, the more educated our population is, the better. Mm -hmm. So if, if someone is seriously considering doing a PhD, then um, I don't want anyone to feel that they shouldn't mm -hmm. do it because of what anyone says. Yeah. I think everyone should always do what... What do what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always the consideration of why are you doing the PhD and what mm -hmm. do you want to do next. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty big at the moment on one and five year plans. Yep. So have a think about your one and five year plan and, and how the PhD fits into that. Uh, the other thing is to think about uh, who you're doing the PhD with. So I mm -hmm. can't stress enough to you really want to be doing your PhD with the best person in the field you're interested in um, because as a PhD student is the time that you are, you actually have the most value to people because mm -hmm. you cost the less. Yep. <laughs> um, they can employ you for peanuts. Exactly. <laughs> yep. 
But there's also a, a certain element of having to get on well with your – you can have the best in the field and you may not get on with them at all, mm. which can make be awkward. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so I, my comment, I I don't really think about that because I don't haven't seen many examples of that happening mm-hmm. and so it doesn't really come into my brain mm-hmm. how important it is for that um, – uh, supervisor student interaction mm-hmm. uh, it just doesn't come to my head but I do I do know that it's very important and 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 some people in particular need to think more than yeah about it yes oh and so what about kids that are leaving school so you you knew what you wanted to do but there's kids and there's a great deal of pressure for them to make decisions so what what about what for those kids if they were or asking you what they should do or- yep uh, so I was I mean <laughs> Every, I wonder how many people, I'd like you to do a poll, mm-hmm. how many people are suggesting to do exactly what they did? Because there are, people, I think, have a bias mm-hmm. towards telling you to do do what I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to tell everyone to do what I did mm-hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> and follow the subjects you're interested in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and perhaps at the, the stage of choosing a, uh, the degree that you're doing is to be aware of, of what it actually means so i did the bachelor of science in nanotechnology what it means is i did a bachelor of science Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't really mean nanotechnology that doesn't become a thing whereas Mm -hmm. if you do a bachelor of what's it called is it bachelor of science in physiotherapy yeah Mm -hmm. at the end of it you become a physiotherapist yeah i became a scientist i didn't become a nanotechnologist Mm. Uh, and i mean I didn't have many people who went to university before me. I didn't really have role models. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I didn't know my father went to university, even though I probably did. <laughs> Vague <memories. laughs> As And so I didn't understand the university talk and, and these university things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, yeah. Go look, in, look ask questions, up. find <laughs> yeah. that out. <laughs> yes. and, and follow your passions, really, yeah. I suppose. It's, it's... Yeah, that's, what, that's really what I'm getting at. Yeah. I, yeah. Do you know where your thesis is today? Could you go and could you go and put your hands on your thesis if if we said where's your thesis? Oh, uh, so I think so. I have printed a couple of cop- uh, four copies, I think. Mm-hmm. So okay. I'm sure one is on my the bookshelf of my parents' place. Have they read it? No. <laughs> um, so I'm sure everyone's told you this, but the most read part of the thesis is <laughs> the <laughs> acknowledgements. <laughs> For my honors thesis, I misspelled my co-supervisor's name (laughs) and I'm sure that's the only part of the thesis he ever read as well (laughs) Uh, and so I learned at that stage how important the acknowledgements are Mm -hmm. so it's your Oscar moment though isn't it yeah I think my acknowledgements must be pretty good Uh, so one in my parents place I had one in my office at University of Adelaide Mm -hmm. I don't have an office I have a open space cubicle at UniSA so I think it's still in that office unless they've moved it somewhere um (laughs) I should go find that. <laughs> Brilliant. We do ask and, and we get some very strange answers oh, where yeah, people like keep their Popping, popping up somebody's um, screen or. Oh. Yep. <laughs> um, and have you ever done this reflection before, like thought back on the journey that you've had? So, yes, I have. So mm-hmm. I am a co-host of Published Parish or Podcast. Mm-hmm. And I know you've had Andy on, mm-hmm. and I doubt that he mentioned that I exist. No, uh, hey. Because he calls it his podcast, and he never, <laughs> never, ever, <laughs> never, ever mentions me to, to anyone who says it's his podcast. Um, and so, as part of that podcast, we uh, kind of, we mostly make it fun, but we have a serious topic each week, and a lot of it has been based on reflections of ourselves and, mm-hmm. and advice to, to PhD students. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I have So you I have are primed to answer that question. Yep. Yep. And so finally, um, what have you, have you heard any myths that you just think that's rubbish that, that are related to academia or the PhD that you really want to say, this is not true? Yep. Mm. Okay. So the biggest myth, and I fall for this as well, is that even though I have a PhD, I'm not an expert in anything except for my very niche area of research. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so I probably come across as I have an air of superiority on so many more topics than I actually have expertise in. You know, I play cricket, mm-hmm. for example, and all the teammates, if there's ever an argument going on and <laughs> I'm on one side of the argument, people say, trust him, he's a doctor. <laughs> 
and I will never ever correct anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Who does like, that? yes, I am very wise. <laughs> yeah. I'm very wise, wise and I'm probably not the kind of doctor you think I am. <laughs> yeah, don't say you're a doctor too loudly on a plane. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think that's us. And thank you so much for answering our questions today. It's yes, been, been very, very interesting. With your time. Very funny, actually. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. I had a good time and I'm, I look forward to listening to the whole series. The very last thing that we should end with is a huge thank you to all of the people who came and gave their time to be interviewed for this podcast series. It's very generous. It was very generous of them and it was so fascinating. And after every interview, I felt so inspired <laughs> to be a researcher and, and to use my PhD. So it was a very eye-opening experience and a, um, a, a really interesting experience. Yes, and we're really very grateful to yeah. every single one of them. But we're also especially grateful to Dr. Sharon Pittman for yeah, telling who us, gave us the, about the, grant. <laughs> the inside story about the grant. Yes. yes, she gave us the inside story about the grant that we applied for and we got, which supported um, the production of this podcast. So thank you to Inspiring South Australia and to Sharon uh, for your very generous um, support of our podcast. Thanks for listening to Career Sessions with Dr. Stephanie Champion and Dr. Tamara Agnew. If you like the show and want to know more, check out www.careersessions.com where you can send us your suggestions for future series and subscribe so you know when a new episode is posted. If you love it, tell all your friends and please leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks to our sponsor, Inspiring South Australia, for their generous support, and to our producer, Rory, at Podbooth. Join us next time when we talk careers with another leader in the field.